Kia ora. Welcome everyone to this, our last webinar of 2023. Tonight we are discussing the acute surgical abdomen with Mark Stewart, a general surgeon from Nelson. And we welcome Mark and thank you very much for doing this session again, because uh, we ran through this when we were at the workshop in Nelson and it was uh, very enjoyable, very successful and very, very interesting. So I thought it was well worth uh, sharing it to the wider field of our um of our cohorts. So uh, our session this evening is organised by the Section of Rural Health, the Department of General Practice at the University of Otago and endorsed for one hour of CME by the Rural New Zealand College of General Practitioners. As usual, if you can fill out the evaluation form at the end, and I would love to get a full quota on that and put in any uh, input around what you would like to have as CME next year, I would really, really appreciate that. And if you put in your medical council number, then I can lodge it for your CME points uh, at the end of this week. Uh, as always, we really want an interactive uh, session. So if you have any questions, then please put them in the chat. And we have Gary. Uh, who will collate those and then after sort of each case we will uh, put the questions to Mark. So uh, as much as this format can be interactive, we look forward to your questions. So without further ado, I will hand over to Mark. Thank you very much for joining us and um, the floor is all yours. Thanks very much for the introduction, Lucinda. Um, it's nice to uh, give this presentation again, and uh, I'm glad it was useful last time. Um, and uh, great to meet a new audience of you. I'm sorry I can't see you all and interact properly, but um, we'll trust Gary to provide a, a channel for questions. Um, and uh, yeah, because of the nature of Zoom, I guess um, it could be a bit didactic, but um, I'll do my best to stay uh, engaging for you. And I appreciate that you all work in different practice environments too. So um, I hope the material is useful where you are and um, uh, that at the very least you can contextualize it to your own um, situation. So I'm going to run through a, a few different, um, as the title suggests, inflammatory conditions in the abdomen. Um, and base them around case studies, which are uh, real cases um, that are fairly recent. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, hopefully some areas within the management of each of these conditions where I can give you a relevant um, update of the evidence. Um, now I'm just trying to get my slides to advance. There we are. So um, the first case is a 72 year old woman who's morbidly obese. Uh, has rheumatoid arthritis on prednisone uh, on a number of agents and some other health issues and some surgical history. And she has factor V Leiden and she's had um, thrombotic events in the past. Three months ago, she had severe epigastric pain. Uh, she remembers one specific episode and it's returned again this evening and she's presented to hospital with it. It's more severe this time and radiates to her back. She's vomiting. She hasn't had any recent alcohol and she's a non-smoker. And to examine, she is clearly in pain. Uh, her observations are here, respirate of 20. Um, we note that her um, blood sugar is elevated and she's not diabetic and she's cold. And to examine, she has a tender upper abdomen. Initial chest X-ray and ECG. Um, the chest X-ray is clear, no new ECG changes. And the bloods tell the story. She's got a, a really high lipase of over 3,000. Um, she has some renal failure, um, which is at baseline for her. Um, and we're going to have to keep an eye on her troponin. Um, and her base excess is minus 5. Everything else sort of holding at the moment. So the patient clearly has acute pancreatitis. And what are the priorities when we think about how we're going to manage a patient like this. And I would suggest that these are the things um, that we need to think through. Um, we need some form of risk prediction um, to think through the likelihood that she will recover in a straightforward manner or she'll deteriorate and what we might need to do to support that. And in particular, the aspects of um, management that are relevant to recovering from pancreatitis are nutrition, fluid management, managing the pain because it's really sore, um, thinking about thromboprophylaxis, what are we going to do about her blood sugars? And what imaging will we do and when 
and why. Um, and you may have a, let's start with risk prediction. You might have a, a risk prediction tool that you like to use in your practice. Um, there's several, as you know, there's the Ransom criteria and the, um, the Glasgow Imri score. And um, you're welcome to keep using that. I'm not suggesting that you need to change. Um, but I think if you look across those scores, there's a few sort of key risk factors which I've listed here, um, which are, are common to several of them. And one of the main things is to reassess the patient over 48 hours. Um, an analogy that I quite like is that pancreatitis is like a forest fire. Um, it's, it, it's unpredictable and patients can present looking quite mild. Um, and then you don't really know um, how they're going to progress. And they can clear up and they can die, simmer down and they can smolder for a while and they can flare up again. Um, and the only way you're going to know how, the, how it's going to progress is by observing over a period of time. Um, and so that's the importance of uh, reassessment. And um, for the majority of these patients, having them in some sort of um, hospital environment. Um, whatever score you might use, I find them all a bit clunky. Um, they're fine, but um, we're often busy, aren't we? And um, you could have a number of patients on the go. And you need to, I think, have a simple way of stratifying the patient in front of you. Are they likely to be fine? Are you worried? Or are they really sick? And... Um, like I just said, you, you don't always know necessarily, and you need to give it time to um, declare itself, particularly with pancreatitis. Um, but you can use um, an evidence-based sort of framework. And the Atlanta classification has been around in some form since the 1990s, and it was last updated in 2012-2013. Um, it's what the re research in pancreatitis uses um, to categorize the disease states. Um, and it's a language that certainly people who deal with pancreatitis all the time, um, general surgeons and um, uh, particularly uh, our HPB colleagues, um, are all familiar with this. And if you use this language, they will understand you. Um, and I actually think it's easier to use than those scoring systems. It's not that they don't have value, um, but this is very straightforward. So here are the definitions, right? Mild, moderate, and severe. So the majority of cases you will see are mild pancreatitis. That accounts for 80% or more. And these patients have um, no organ failure and they have no local or systemic complications. And the definition of these is quite specific in the Atlanta classification. So local complications means um, complications within the pancreatic tissue itself, so necrosis um, and peripancreatic fluid collections and other um, directly adjacent complications um, in the abdomen. So uh, pseudoaneurysms, portal vein thrombosis, gastroparesis, colonic um, ischemia, all of those sort of local things, that's a local complication. And systemic complications means um, worsening of pre-existing medical comorbidities. So if the patient has a major cardiac or respiratory um, issue or um, chronic renal failure. If any of those things get worse, that's a systemic complication, slightly weird terminology. But if, if you're reading stuff that, that uses this um, classification system, that's what they mean by a systemic complication. Um, so you can just think of it as existing organ dysfunction that gets worse. Um, and then moderate cases manifest organ failure, but it resolves within 48 hours. So again, for stratifying how these patients are going to do, you need some period of observation. Um, whether that's in hospital or not is up to your judgment, and um, we'll come back to that. So a moderate case either has some degree of organ failure that resolves or the presence of a local or systemic complication. So remember, that just means that they're comorbid or they're developing some local problem that you would have to image to find, probably. Um, and then severe pancreatitis is organ failure that persists. And why is this useful and why is it important? Because it's correlated with bad outcomes. So severe, the mortality can approach 50%. And in severe cases that also have a local complication, the mortality is over 50%. So it's really easy to use and it's a really useful way to stratify 
the risk um, to the person sitting in front of you. That's all I'll say for now about risk stratification. Um, let's think for a minute about nutrition. So pancreatitis is a it's a condition that that keeps on giving. You know that we can explore so many aspects of this, and um, there's active research going on in, in pretty much all of them, um, because it's an inflammatory condition that affects every organ system ultimately, um, and results in a wide variety of outcomes. And the scoring system and classification system we've just been looking at is to try and um, uh, stratify these patients in a way that's useful to clinicians and researchers. Um, but the potential outcomes and convoluted clinical pathways that patients travel down are myriad. Um, so what I'm trying to do is just um, focus on a few areas where I think there are meaningful changes that that you and I can um, implement um, when we when we assess patients who have this problem. So the next okay. one is good. Thanks. Um, the next one is nutrition. All right. So. When you think about nourishing a patient with an inflammatory condition that comes from the organ that produces um, digestive enzymes, there is a tension. So we're, we're playing two principles off against each other. One is the pathophysiology. So the pancreas is auto-digesting. And we worry that if we add enteral nutrition to these patients, um, whether via an enteral feed or just letting them eat by mouth. Um, we stimulate the pancreas and we cause worsening autodigestion. On the other hand, we know that if we starve the gut, the enterocytes are unhappy and that causes gut inflammation and that might make people worse as well. So what's the right answer? Um, there are a couple of meta-analyses um, from just the year before. Um, looking at reasonable numbers of patients and again, focused on mild acute pancreatitis, which I think is most relevant because this is what we see most, um, showing that if you implement a full diet early in the various ways that they measured it, what it all boils down to really is if you give a full diet early on, the outcomes are probably better. Length of stay seems to be shorter by about 50% and that's sort of reproduced over all of these studies that I've summarized on this page. Um, and the big ones, the meta-analyses, don't really show any difference in what you might think of as the more important outcomes, um, pain, complications, readmissions, progression to severe acute pancreatitis, but certainly feeding early doesn't do any harm, and it might do some good. Um, this paper suggested that there was a lower risk of diet intolerance, and then we can um, drill down into just one randomized controlled trial. Now, um, I, I highlight this one because I think its its findings are useful, and it wasn't included in these meta-analyses because these authors included patients with moderate acute pancreatitis, so it got excluded. Mm -hmm. um, and we know, we've know we known for a long time for more severe pancreatitis that you should implement early enteral feeding. So the, the question about this is really um, to do with patients who have a mild pancreatitis by Atlanta classification. Um, so in this paper, which is it's a decent size for a surgical paper, over 100 patients in it, um, and 99% of patients in the early feeding group resumed their diet immediately versus nearly three days later in the conventional therapy group. So conventionally, we would um, hold diet, um, allow people to have clear fluids or free fluids um, on admission, and as they tolerate it um, with good analgesia, slowly, gradually in increase their diet back to normal, right, and probably to a low-fat diet to begin with. So um, the comparison here shows that actually, if you provide a full diet early, the diet intolerance is significantly lower. So only one person in the early refeeding group didn't tolerate what they were given versus 20% in the conventional feeding group. And the primary outcome of this paper was um, length of stay. And again, the early feeding group go home in about half the time. Um, this particular paper did suggest that there was a lower progression to moderate acute pancreatitis and complications and a lower incidence of ICU admissions in the early refeeding group. Whether that's borne out in the long term, we'll wait and see, but it's at least suggestive evidence. So I think the bottom line is, you can feed these people. And if they can tolerate um, the food, then let them eat. Um, 
Mark, what's the definition of diet intolerance? Like, is that just a short term? This isn't talking about like longer term gut, or that's what you're saying. No. So, what's your definition of diet? Right. No, it, it, so it's talking about during the admission. admission. So, yeah, if during the recovery from pancreatitis, um, you then try and feed them and they can't tolerate the food and there's a right. delay to re establishing diet. Yeah. As simple as that. As simple as that. Um, so full diet immediately on demand. And um, the second point there is just for completion, but it, this is not new um, data, early NG feed in severe pancreatitis. Um, so what about fluids? Well, this study, um, again, from 2022, recruited 250 patients across 18 centers in Spain and randomized participants to aggressive fluid resuscitation um, versus assessment-based fluid resuscitation. And of course, traditionally, we would fill these patients up if someone had pancreatitis, you flood them and wait for them to pee it out. And that was all right because they're going to third space a lot, right? So they need all the fluid. That was the thinking. Um, so it turns out we weren't right. Um, this study was halted early um, because 20% of the aggressive fluid recess group developed overload with no um, observed benefits in their outcomes to show for it. There have been a number of studies um, sort of before and some ongoing um, that uh, seek to answer this question. Most of them are not that well designed, it has to be said, and they have a variety of primary outcomes um, that aren't necessarily the ones you would really want to know about. Um, but what they all kind of boil down to is that the right thing to do is give a balanced crystalloid solution like ringers um, and in goal-directed boluses and not to target um, certain amounts of fluid or um, put patients into fluid overload. So the key point is goal-directed therapy. So look at the patient, you know, if they're normovolemic and they can eat and drink, then they don't need IV fluids. They just need to eat and drink. And if they're hypovolemic, then you should give them a bolus and resuscitate them. And that should be a judicious, say, 10 mil per kg and then reassess. And if they can't tolerate their diet, then give them some slow maintenance until they are eating and reassess them. Um, and, and they'll make progress. Um, so that's a quick comment on fluids. Analgesia, I don't really have any specific updates here that are high quality other than to say um, the entire ladder is appropriate um, so long as there's no contraindications, obviously, in an individual, such as to non-steroidals with chronic nerve failure. A lot of these patients are really sore and end up with a PCA. There is some emerging evidence that epidurals um, decrease complication rates in severe pancreatitis, um, but that's sort of emerging. It's limited data, and we'll wait and see how that plays out. Um, I will just make a comment on Clexane. Almost every general surgical patient gets prophylactic Clexane if they end up on a ward. Um, and... In pancreatitis, um, there's no exception to that. It's an inflammatory condition. It's prothrombotic, and patients should have chemical and mechanical thromboprophylaxis. Um, but this paper came out earlier this year and um, caused a lot of discussion in HPB circles um, because um, this is a systematic review and meta-analysis of RCTs um, looking at giving um, therapeutic dose clexane in not mild now, but moderately severe and severe acute pancreatitis. Um, they managed to include a decent number of patients, um, but I have a, a, an issue with this paper, um, which I need to highlight first, and then we'll get into what's actually good about it. So um, the problem, as I see it, is that they compared conventional treatment so-called, with conventional treatment plus therapeutic dose lexane. And that's hmm. none of our patients. They excluded patients with prophylactic anticoagulation for DVT. So patients who were on 40 milligrams of clexane, which is sort of all of our patients, <laughs> were excluded from this meta-analysis because they were only comparing patients who got no chemical thromboprophylaxis to therapeutic dose and they had a range of relevant outcomes but its redeeming grace is when you drill into the main findings so if we look at 
pancreatic necrosis, which is a serious local complication. You see that they've documented the risk with conventional therapy was about 25%, um, which is a lot. Um, mm. And that's, that's what we observe, actually, even when we give prophylactic clexane. So when we have patients with severe pancreatitis, that is about how much necrosis we see. Whereas in their therapeutic group, they got that down to 5 or 6% with no increase in severe bleeding events. So if this plays out in practice, then this is a therapy worth implementing for patients who have moderate and severe pancreatitis. And I think it, it needs to be assessed in real life. And no doubt there will be units even in New Zealand who will do that and then report their own data. Um, but I think what we can all take away from it is please don't forget to give at least some clexane because it's important. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and then finally, imaging. So everybody who has pancreatitis should have a gallbladder ultrasound because gallstones and alcohol are the commonest causes. They account for over 90% of cases. And in New Zealand, it's skewed towards gallstones. So you need to exclude gallstones and deal with them if they're present. Not right now, um, but you need to deal with them pretty soon. Um, and if the patient remains in your care and unwell, at what point do you need cross-sectional imaging? And um, I'd suggest that it's after two to three days if they're failing to improve, because that's how long you're assessing them, right? To see how they stratify out. Do they have mild disease that's gonna resolve quickly? Do they have um, persisting symptoms at two to three days and you need to exclude a local complication? Or um, if they seem to be getting better and you didn't, scan them remember it's like a forest fire you know so they might not be better by five days and if you haven't got imaging by then and they're still in hospital and not clearly about to walk out the door then it's probably time to image so what happened with this patient she was admitted to hdu quite appropriately she got judicious fluid management and a strict fluid balance quite appropriately i think she got good analgesia Essentially, I don't have any issues with how um, we managed her. Um, and she got what we would have given at the time, which is prophylactic clexane and regular blood sugar monitoring. She seemed to be doing all right and stepped down. Um, but uh, yeah, a day later, she was um, deteriorating. She now had myocardial ischemia and heart failure and acidosis. And she went back to ICU and was not salvageable and uh, ended up in a spiral of multi-organ dysfunction and passed away uh, 24 hours later. And such is the nature of pancreatitis. So the, the key updates that I would take away from this um, uh, brief summary uh, is you can feed them early, um, give goal-directed fluids, and don't forget clexane. And I've added a couple of extra slides at the end um, in response to some questions and comments that we got last time. And so the first one is about safety netting. And, um, it, you know, it's a reasonable question. If you can feed these patients early and they don't need fluids and they can manage their pain, then can they go home? And I suppose the answer is maybe, um, but you have to be very careful and selective about that because remember the forest fire, you don't really know early on who's going to flare. Um, the most, patient, most patients you see will have mild pancreatitis. If they don't meet SIRS criteria, then the chance that they progress is pretty small, to be fair. So in your practice environment, if you feel comfortable sending them home and they've got sensible people with them, then maybe that's okay. But I think you need to have them repeat their CIP probably daily for 48 hours and have some form of or well, some some way of checking in on them in about 48 hours to make sure that they are getting better um, because you will miss some if you don't um, that need help. Um, if they meet SIRS criteria, um, which I'll, I'll go through later um, with another a case, but hopefully it's pretty familiar to everybody, um, the chance that they progress to moderate pancreatitis is closer to 20%. Um, so I think it's um, it's taking a risk not to put that person somewhere where they can be watched. 
Um, but again, you know your local resources and you have to do what, what's right in your environment, but just be aware of what you are doing and what the risk is. Um, and then the other thing that I wanted to comment on is um, I was asked about how do you actually go about figuring out the cause of pancreatitis? Um, and elements of this we will remember from medical school. I think we all remember learning, I get smashed. Um, but, well, what do we really do? So I've already said you have to do a gallbladder ultrasound because um, gallstone pancreatitis is common. Um, and the next commonest cause is alcohol. And that's going to be nine out of 10 cases. So you cover those off first. So everybody who comes in needs a gallbladder ultrasound if they haven't had one recently. Um, and do they have a relevant alcohol history? Because if they do, then it's alcohol pancreatitis until proven otherwise, really. If they don't have a relevant alcohol history and gallstones are present, then it's gallstone pancreatitis. And the right thing to do is take out the gallbladder um, on that admission, if possible. Um, and again, I know that's resource dependent, but we've had good data since 2006 with a Cochrane review showing that early cholecystectomy saves lives um, in this condition and that patients often have re-presentations and often the second presentation is more severe and it can be a life-threatening condition, right? So if you can get the gallbladder out and you know that there's gallstones, then it should be done as soon as it's safe to do. And that's ideally during the first admission once the inflammation's settled and the pain is gone, to my mind, they're good to go to theatre. If you've excluded gallstones and alcohol, then you have to think through the finer print. So I get smashed is useful here. Um, we'll come back to idiopathic. We've ruled out gallstones and ethanol. Trauma should be pretty obvious. Um, steroids is there to remind you about corticosteroids, but also sex steroids, which um, means estrogens. Um, but to be fair, they're pretty rare as causes, but you need to be aware of it. Mumps should be obvious. Autoimmune um, really means IgG4 disease. We're not going to see scorpion bites. Um, hypertriglyceridemia and hypercalcemia are easy to test for, right? So you can do that probably while they're in hospital. Um, recent ERCP should again be obvious. Um, and then drugs. Now, drugs is at the end um, for good reason, because there's a huge array of drugs that have potentially been implicated in causing pancreatitis. There isn't good evidence for most of them, in fairness. Um, there's a handful, and I've kind of put them here, um, of the ones that you might see, but they're all going to be rare. Um, so and the algorithm also misses anatomical variants like pancreas division. So how do you really do this? Um, I think you check the calcium and the triglycerides, and if those are normal, then you might send off IgG subclasses, and in a couple of days, you'll get the IgG4 back. If those are all normal, then at some stage, as an outpatient, they should have an MR pancreas to rule out anatomic variants. And if really all of that is negative, then you can interrogate the drug history, and you really need to go through and think, is there anything here um, that could be implicated. And if they haven't had a recent change in their drugs, then it's probably not going to be a drug. Um, and if you ruled out all of that, then it's idiopathic until it happens again. And then you need to repeat the ultrasound and kind of start again. Um, but the fine print doesn't really need repeating. It's You're looking for the, the big stuff. So is there any alcohol history? Then they probably should stop touching any form of alcohol. Um, and it's time they got a surgical review, regardless of what's happened until this point, because some patients have microlithiasis, and it may be appropriate to just take the gallbladder out in a young fit patient to exclude that um, because of the risk of getting pancreatitis again. Um, and alternatively, they can have an EUS and look for those micro stones. Can I just quickly, if you go back to that one, can you um, quantify what a relevant alcohol history is, and also what is regarded as a significant triglyceride and calcium levels? Sure. Um, so alcohol, let's start with that. Um, there's usually a precipitating event. Um, so if people have a, a regular kind of level of alcohol that they consume and they've been doing it for a long time, then it's hard to imagine that suddenly 
it's a relevant consideration. Might be, um, but you're more looking for um, a recent binge or recent intake that's higher than that patient's normal. You have to be careful with that because having said that, once a patient has alcoholic pancreatitis, the pancreas is sensitized to alcohol like a toxin. So mm. they've had one episode, then if they even touch alcohol again, they can have another one. So if you if you have any reason really to suspect that alcohol is the cause, then you have to advise that they don't drink. And then you're about to find out. They're either going to drink again and get it again. Um, and Or if they do have gallstones and they really deny that there's been any change to their drinking pattern then you should probably take out the gallbladder so it's not typically a consequence of a chronic heavy drinker it's more uh, of an okay. acute change in the amount that they drink around the world um you'll see it in in um chronic heavy drinkers more um but i find in the new zealand population that's less commonly the pattern yeah but it can be as well yeah Thank i'm you. sorry it's a, not a, you know. I, I mean, it's interesting. Like, yeah. I sound like talking with both sides of the mouth, but um, yeah, you you see it all, and sometimes it's yeah. not it's not easy to tease them apart. No, yeah, it's an interesting yeah. point, and yeah, just the triglycerides and the calcium levels. What would be regarded um, as significant there? Off the top of my head, I, I can't remember. Sorry. Okay. I always no, right. every time I see it because it's pretty rare. Um, but it's uh, so any hypercalcemia that's clinically significant. Um, and the hypertriglyceridemia is really high. So right. not just up a little bit, it's an obvious spike in the triglycerides, whatever the other lipids might be on the profile. Um, and if you find that, then you should involve an endocrinologist and they will help you uh, get it down and look after the patient probably. Mm. Brilliant. Thank you. All good. And um, that's the end of part one. Brilliant. There's no questions on the chat. So um at some point we might come back. I'd just be interested to know, like say, talk to Gary around, like, you know, saying, um, Dunstan, how long you might hold on to these people, Gary, or do you typically ship them out? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's actually probably a really good thing to touch um, to touch on, actually. So, so my, be bearing in mind, there's, like you said, there's a big variation in the resources that we have in our institutions, but... For a lot of people, it may well be that all they really have access to locally is perhaps point of care blood tests, and obviously you can give IV fluids and things. Um, ultrasound is probably a luxury that might visit occasionally, um, if 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 at all. Although, it, it perhaps if this is recurrent, the patient may well have already had a recent ultrasound. But you know, just in those sort of circumstances. It, what do you have any idea of sort of what point you think it's reasonable to keep that patient to, or, or when do you think they should um, they they should be sort I, of heading away? I think if you can take OBS and you can get bloods, then you can stratify the risk to some degree, and if if they meet biochemical diagnostic criteria for hepatitis. Um, we didn't talk about that actually, but um, the criteria right are um, pain that's typical, um, an elevated lipase, and um, imaging that supports the diagnosis. So we're assuming that we don't have access to imaging. So if you've got the other two, um, but clinically um, they don't meet SERS criteria, then I think you can you don't have to ship them anywhere. Um, if they do meet SERS criteria, then um, you know, I can't speak for what you guys would do because you're more experienced at being in that position than I am. But if it was me, I think I would be discussing it with somebody um, to find out their appetite for taking the patient. And if if together you agree that it's fine to keep them locally um, with some safety netting, then that's okay. I hope that answers the question or at least gives a perspective. You know, that, that's helpful. I mean, there may be others in the audience that have actually got some views or want a little bit of input into that. Mm. But, but you see, you see a, a rise in, in lipase. I mean, it's not uncommon for other reasons to get a, a tiny elevation in lipase. Three which times we, the upper limit of normal. Yeah, which we tend to just, to ignore, don't we? So yeah, three well, times, I, three, 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I ignore them too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, and, and just to, to be clear for everyone, so lipase to make the diagnosis and then you, you follow it with the CRP, right? So you're going to do a lipase and CRP. And if the lipase is three times the upper limit of normal and the pain fits, then you can call it acute pancreatitis and follow it with a CRP. Very good clarification point. Thank you. All right, next one. Mm -hmm. Yep, roll on. Case two. Um, now, I think pancreatitis actually was the most gritty con um, discussion. So I think they get a bit um, a bit more straight yeah. from here on. Um, so case two is a 47-year-old man who's got five days of left lower quadrant pain and sweats. And he had a similar episode three years earlier and was in hospital and was diagnosed as having epiploic appendagitis. Um, he's got no particular localizing or concerning features, but he does have a background of psoriatic arthritis and he's on a tanacept for that, um, some other medical issues. Um, and in ED, he's requiring quite a lot of IV morphine to get comfortable. Um, to look at, his obs are there, pretty reassuring. Uh, he looks comfortable. Um, and to examine, he is tender, particularly in the left lower quadrant, but not peritonitic. And here's his bloods. He's discussed with the general surgery registrar, who not surprisingly asks for a CT. And here it is. So we can see thickening in the sigmoid colon and some pericolonic fat stranding, and a few diverticuli and a couple of big calcified ones, all consistent with acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis. And um, I haven't set up the technology in my talk to ask you all for a, a poll, um, but you can ask yourself some questions. Um, would you give this patient antibiotics? What do you think about his gut function? Should we rest his gut from food while he recovers? When he goes home, whenever that is, um, what dietary advice will you give him? Should he be on a low-fiber diet or a high-fiber diet or just normal food? And does he need a colonoscopy? And before I give you my answers, uh, just to clarify, we're talking about acute uncomplicated diverticulitis. So complicated diverticulitis is quite a different beast and it's got a grading system and it encompasses anything from a small pericolonic abscess um, or a couple of other things that are not here and not part of this classification, which we often use, like a, a visible perforation on CT, for instance, of course, at this point, you won't have a CT. Um, but any collection of, of pus in the abdomen or free purulent or feculent peritonitis is complicated diverticulitis. And um, we're not, strictly speaking, talking about that right now. But a patient like the one you see in front of you, what about those things? Um, if I go back for a tick. Antibiotics, gut rest, long-term dietary advice, and does he need a colonoscopy? Um, and in summary, this is my advice to you for managing acute, uncomplicated diverticulitis. Most of the things we thought we had to do, probably we don't need to do, and they probably weren't helping very much. Um, but to drill into that a little bit, firstly, the antibiotics. I think this is a really useful um, paper um, mm -hmm. because it's a meta-analysis and it involves over a thousand patients. And these are quite telling numbers. So remember, just uncomplicated diverticulitis, much like the patient that we saw in the in the cameo. These authors found that if antibiotics were given, the number needed to treat to lower the risk of treatment failure, in other words, to lower the risk that a patient progresses to complicated diverticulitis, was 32. But one in 24 had some kind of antibiotic-related problem, whether that was an allergy or C. diff, for, for instance. And there's been, I think, um, four meta-analyses in the past five years um, that have all failed to demonstrate benefit to antibiotics in uncomplicated diverticulitis. And they were followed by this Cochrane review, which is in the top right corner there, um, last year, which couldn't reach consensus on whether there was benefit in antibiotics uh, in this condition or not. And in the New Zealand context, we have the STAN study, um, which is well-designed um, and a useful algorithm for us to follow in clinical practice, I think, um, particularly because it's it's homegrown um, and uh, its results are fairly robust. 
Um, so it's a, a double blind placebo controlled RCT. And um, the patients enrolled all had CT proven uncomplicated diverticulitis. This was done um, during the years that I was a trainee um, in the Auckland region uh, across all three DHBs there. Um, and ultimately they showed there was no difference in length of stay if antibiotics were given um, and no detrimental findings either. So the important thing though is who was ed um, eligible to enroll in the STAN study. And I think this is um, uh, useful for thinking about who needs antibiotics in diverticulitis. So you can target antibiotics to particular patient circumstances, patients who have SIRS, because if a patient had SIRS during the STAN study, they were excluded from the trial. And I think that's probably quite conservative compared to some of the papers around the world. But if you want to be conservative and just dip your toes in the water of this evidence, then this is a great way to do it. So if the patient has SIRS, and here's the SIRS criteria on the right, they're pretty straightforward, aren't they? An abnormal temperature, tachycardia, tachypnea, or a high white cell count with certain cutoffs. So if patients have two out of four, then they meet SIRS criteria. And in the case of uncomplicated diverticulitis, you should give them antibiotics. Um, and then other certain groups. So immunocompromised, remember the patient um, is on etanocept. So uh, we could put him in that category. So he probably should have antibiotics. Um, and anyone with a major medical comorbidity, any complicated diverticulitis on CT. Um, and again, I appreciate that people are in different practice environments. And can you get a CT where you work? And if you can't, then um, that's okay. You just have to use your clinical judgment and um, think about the patient's symptoms in front of you. And um, if you think that the most likely diagnosis is diverticulitis, then make a judgment as to where you think they sit in the, in the risk ladder, I guess. Can I just um, elaborate on that further, Mark? So if you think they've got uncomplicated diverticulitis, remembering that I work in um, primary care currently, uncomplicated diverticulitis, uh, and you know maybe we've had a previous colonoscopy and we've got the know that they've got diverticuli or or we might not. Um, how long would you say if you opt not to give them antibiotics initially? How long would you wait and change that decision potentially? Say if the pain didn't. I mean, you know, and they were still, if the pain didn't improve, say, and they still remained stable, would you then, would that change your decision or would, you I know, think, what would you um, do in that situation? I think 48 hours is reasonable. And uh, actually at the end of this segment, I've got a, a summary of um, a, a how I think you should practically manage these patients, um, which I think is I'll a hold, good, I'll wait. Um, resource constrained environments. So hopefully that helps answer the question uh, when we get there, if that's all right. Um mm. So um, moving on to diet, uh, this is a relatively recent, I suppose, 2018, it's a few years old, um, but a systematic review of 600 patients that showed no evidence for restrictive diets in the recovery from acute diverticulitis. Now, the data is, is largely observational and it's not particularly high quality um, and subsequent studies have remained small, but they continue to show no detriment to early full diet as tolerated, much like in pancreatitis. And um, this is another shift that I've seen um, during probably my time post-training, really. Um, uh, in, in relatively recent years, we used to admit all these patients, put them on IV fluids, IV antibiotics, and give them basically clear fluids until their pain was easing, and then gradually um, increase their diet. Um, there's no evidence that that's beneficial. So you can feed these patients up front according to what they can tolerate. Um, and I'll talk more about fiber uh, a little bit later on. Um, cancer risk, do you need a colonoscopy? No is the short answer, um, but you should treat these patients like you would anyone else. So if there's PR bleeding, then that needs to be investigated, and that will often involve a colonoscopy, just follow your local pathway. Um, and complicated diverticulitis, certainly you should, because if there's a perforation or, um, or, or an abscess, then there's a higher risk of an underlying mass lesion being missed. Um, but most significant masses will be seen on CT. So in uncomplicated diverticulitis, there is no increased risk of bowel cancer compared to the general population. So you don't routinely need to do a colonoscopy. In these specific situations, you should request one, and when it's settled down is the right time to do it. So after about the first six weeks is appropriate. And then when these patients go home, what are you going to ask them to do? Well, we do know that there's some risk factors for diverticular disease, 
And these are the main ones. And some of them are modifiable, right? Western diet, obesity, smoking, certain drugs, particularly NSAIDs, um, which, by the way, are fine for managing the acute illness, but um, it's, it's worth advising these patients not to use NSAIDs in the long term to help prevent recurrences. But you have to put all of this in context. This is a condition that has a 20% risk of recurrence in 10 years. And most people who have diverticulitis have one episode and they never have it again. The ones who do have recurrences, most of them, the first episode is the most severe that they'll ever have. Most of them. So surgery for diverticulitis, recurrent episodes that are um, impairing a patient's lifestyle. Occasionally, we'll still do an anterior resection to manage that, but that's a rare situation. And the vast majority of people are not going to be bothered by this again, even if they've been in hospital with it once. So it's hard, I think, to argue that someone needs to radically alter their diet and their lifestyle for this sort of risk of recurrence of a condition that's not particularly dangerous. Um, so most of this is just healthy lifestyle advice, right? And you know your patient the best. And if you think that this is just the kick they need to stop them from smoking or doing something else that's generally good for their health, then sure, go for it and advise them to do so. But um, just to prevent diverticulitis in and of itself, um, I don't think dramatic lifestyle changes are really worth it. Um, the fiber issue, we used to say low fiber diet early to allow people to recover. And I think really the answer is if it makes them feel better, then that's fine. But they can have a full diet if they can tolerate it. And you might consider um, bulk laxatives or um, fiber supplements for patients who just don't get enough diet into their uh, fiber into their regular diet to maintain um, a regular bowel habit. Um, but you don't need to kind of blanket, prescribe it or recommend it for patients just with diverticular disease. So in summary, you know, in and of itself, it's a condition that we've overtreated and overcomplicated the dietary advice and overestimated the cancer risk. So relax. And what I mean by that is not don't take it seriously. Just think about all the things you want to do to this person. Do they really need antibiotics? Do they really need a colonoscopy? Do they really need anything that you're suggesting um, to help them get better? And so then what do you do about this wherever you happen to be? Um, if you want to read more about it, um, there is a, a good BPAC article from earlier this year that was um, reviewed by Ian Bissett, um, and it's pretty comprehensive, um, and uh, I commend it to you. Um, you know, if you want to learn more about day-to-day um, -day management of diverticulitis in primary care in New Zealand, um, but I've boiled it down to you, for you into what I think is a fairly pragmatic algorithm, so you need to take a history and exam. And this is one of the situations in clinical medicine where a rectal exam is still relevant um, and do their bloods and think about other causes of the pain and exclude red flags and think about does the patient have specific medical comorbidities that make them a higher risk of doing poorly and do they meet SERS criteria? Because if they do, then you should at least think about whether they need a CT and you know think practically about what that means for you, where you and your patient are. Um, and you should think about whether they need antibiotics too. If you're not in this category, then it's probably okay to send them home with some analgesia. And if cramps are a major issue, then some buscopan. Think about oral antibiotics when they go home. If they've got a comorbidity or they borderline meet SERS criteria, but you really don't think they need to be in the hospital, that's fine. But you might want to give that person antibiotics. Um, you can advise them to eat whatever they like. Um, as much as they can tolerate. So as simple a diet as they can, as they need to, to manage some nutrition and hydration, um, but they don't need specific restrictions from us. And if they're not getting better in 48 hours, then you need to step up. So if they're not on antibiotics, you might start them. Um, and if they're deteriorating, then they probably should go somewhere where they can have a CT and have complicated diverticulitis excluded. Um, so I hope that's helpful, Lucinda. Um, can yes, you can you just clarify what exactly you're looking for on the rectal exam? <laughs> um, so I'm looking for um, a low rectal cancer, right. which might confuse you. Um, and short of a colonoscopy, there's no other good way to look for it. Um, this is an aside, but um, 
I don't trust CTCs for low rectal cancer. They're fine for everything else, but where the balloon sits, they can miss things. So a uh, rectal exam is still relevant. Good. It's not, to, to be clear. Um, we, we, we overdid them. Something else we overdid in the past, but yeah. Um, yeah, there, there's certain situations where I think it's still worth it. It is good use. It is good to do a test when it's it or an exam when it's useful, isn't it? Mm. Uh, now, Gary, there was a couple of questions in there. Have we answered them? Yeah, I think you probably have largely answered them. They're largely around diet in that acute phase. But I, by saying just let them eat what they want, I think you've probably largely covered that. Um, and it doesn't sound like there's any particular place now for a low residue diet. Just let them have what they want. Um. And the, there was another question just around Clexane. So is that Clexane for if you admit them, but not if you don't admit them? As simple as that? I think so, yeah. Um, pending any any um, new evidence or potentially evidence that I'm not aware of. Um, but I, I think if they're going to be confined to a hospital bed, then yes, they should have chemical thromboprophylaxis. But if you're sending them home, I, I'm not aware of evidence for it in this situation. Maybe we should, but I don't know the answer. Yeah. Great. Thank you. All right. Next one. Am I taking too long? Do I need to hurry up? Well, we roll a wee bit over, but um, I think you're doing a great job, Mark. So All right. don't race too much. Sure. Um, well, I can go fairly quickly through the case for this one because hopefully it's a fairly obvious conclusion. Um, yeah. yeah we're all and, good at reading. So. Yeah, you're good at reading. Okay. There you go. So this patient is a bit sore and a bit flushed and the junior doctor in ED thinks she's got either gastro because of some sick contacts or appendicitis and decides to watch her for a few hours and think about a CT and give her some fluids and keep her comfortable in the meantime. And it's in the evening, so she reviews in the middle of the night at three o'clock, and the woman's still sore. Bloods have now come back with a high white cell count, and the exam has progressed to guarding in the right lower quadrant. And so the diagnosis is... Da -da -da. But um, the assessing clinician has documented not a classic story as still feels pain is all over and some right upper quadrant tenderness and has gastro contact, so they decided to do a CT which beautifully and probably unnecessarily demonstrates the appendix here as inflamed. So yes, it's acute appendicitis. And um, when I was asked to do this talk, I, I did think for a while, what can I possibly teach experienced clinicians about acute appendicitis? But um, we can talk about how you make the diagnosis, which has been a conundrum forever. Um, because it's a common condition, but it is often hard to diagnose, and it's important to diagnose because it's surgically managed, um, and the consequences can be significant if it's not well managed. And so to some degree, it's nice to avoid a CT, but the more important reason to make the diagnosis is to lower the negative appendicectomy rate. You don't want to be operating on people who don't have acute appendicitis. Now, we'll never get that to zero because it's a hard diagnosis to make. So the sensitivity and specificity are never going to be 100%. And if we don't get it wrong sometimes, then we'll miss people who do have the disease. But we want to get it as low as we can safely. And I commend to you the append score, if you don't know it already. Um, this is a, an evidence-based New Zealand innovation, and it's very easy to use. And I ask my registrars to use it, and it's what they tell me over the phone if they ring me to discuss it possible appendicitis case. Um, and firstly, I'll just go through it, and then I'll talk to you about it. So it's really easy to use. A-P-P-E-N-D, append. These are six clinical criteria that you can determine whether they're present or not. Anorexia, pain means classic migratory pain. So it has to start centrally and migrate to the right iliac fossa. The next P is for peritonism. So that means peritonism that's localized in the right iliac fossa, however you determine that it's present by your examination. And then E and N are for raised inflammatory markers with these cutoffs, and you get an extra point if you're a male. So D is for dude. And the nice thing about this is that you can then 
calculate someone's score and easily stratify them into three groups that are useful groups. If the score is zero or one, you can observe quite likely out of hospital because the negative predictive value is 100%, and you might want to think about other diagnoses. If the score is five or six, then you can operate because the positive predictive value is 94%, and you're never going to get 100. And for everyone in the middle, so two to four, you can investigate with some form of imaging, probably, and most of the time that will be an ultrasound. Now, this score was developed in Middlemore, and it was developed to answer a specific problem. So they realized there that their negative appendicectomy rate was too high, it was approaching 20%. And so they did logistic regression on several years of data and worked out what were the clinical features that were most commonly present in patients who had a histologically proven diagnosis of acute appendicitis. So they looked back and they calculated which of these things were, were most often there. And they had a big long list. And then they went down the list and drew the cutoff for calculating a score at various points. And they worked out that if you took the top six, then you got these numbers. And then they implemented the score and prospectively assessed the, the, the consequences of that. And in doing so, they managed to half their negative appendicectomy rate. And it's still quite high. It's 9%, but it's a lot better than, than 19. And so it's very easy to apply. Um, it is just a tool, so it's not cookbook medicine, um, and you need to use it properly and in the right context. So patients who have right iliac fossa pain of less than seven days are appropriate, um, and you still have to assess the pain properly, um, and you have to think about all the other associated symptoms to exclude other diagnoses, particularly GI diagnoses and urinary and um, genital um, and um, and reproductive symptoms. So se sexual and menstrual history are important. You obviously still need to do an MSU. You still need a beta HCG. Anyone who's over 50 needs a CT because even if they look like they've got appendicitis, they're quite likely to have something else. Um, and it's worth noting that the score isn't validated in children. Um, but having said that, I still find it quite useful um, with pediatric patients as kind of a rough guide to what they're likely to have. Um, and in pregnancy, even if the score is high, you will get some form of imaging before subjecting the patient to an operation. And often, you know, clinically, they don't look typical anyway. Um, so that's how you apply this score. Um, and I, I find it very easy to use and very useful. So we can look back at this patient history and we can apply the score. And um, in doing so, there you go. She's got four points. She loses a point for elevated CRP because it wasn't over 15, um, and she's not a male. So her score was four. And purely based on the score, the right thing to do is imaging. Um, if you were going to do imaging, probably an ultrasound in the morning would have been fine. Um, but based on the history as read, you might say, well, that's pretty convincing for appendicitis. And that's fine. Diagnostic laparoscopy is an appropriate test um, to make the diagnosis as well. And this is a tool. So there will be some people with a score of four that you decide to just take to theatre. Um, but it's certainly very useful um, for broad stroke categorization of what's the likelihood of appendicitis. And it's not always easy, as you know. Um, so that's the end of that one. If there would are that any... be a um, tool that most surgeons in New Zealand use now? Like that would be pretty broadly used in general surgical? I don't know about um, most might be pushing it, but many. <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you say it, you'll either get uh, what's that or oh, okay, fine. Yeah, okay. Depends who you talk to. Yeah. Yeah. But even if it's um, if it's not helpful for referring, um, hopefully it is, um, and it will increasingly be, I hope, in the future, um, but it's certainly helpful um, for an individual clinician. Um, yeah, and definitely. Thank you. Uh, when you're busy, it's great to have something you can use quickly. Um, any other questions on that? No. So um, case four, um, we're circumnavigating the abdomen, you might have noticed. So uh, this is a 33-year-old woman who's um, had two children and several pregnancies previously, and she's now pregnant and nearly 27 weeks, and she's a BMI of 30. And she was actually just discharged a few days ago from general surgery with some abdominal pain. Um, and the cause wasn't identified. It was 
thought that it was characteristic of appendicitis. So she had an MRI, which was reported as showing no obvious cause for the patient's presentation. Um, and in her background, she had previously lived in Auckland, where she was actually booked to have a cholecystectomy that never eventuated. Um, so during her recent admission, um, her bloods, which were initially sort of inflammatory, settled down and she went home. But since then, she's not got better. She's still sore. Um, the pain, if anything, is worse. Um, she's feeling generally unwell. Um, there's nothing to localize anywhere else. And in fact, she's um, seen her midwife today who doesn't have any obstetric concerns. Um, and also in her background, she's had hypertension in her previous pregnancies. Um, here she is to examine. Uh, her numbers are okay. Um, she's got a soft but tender epigastrium. Um, we'll flick through this. And she was referred to general surgery and given some pain relief. And the impression was likely biliary colic. So she was admitted for observation and uh, given some pain relief and some clexane. And so I think the first question is, what, what do we think is causing her pain? And do we agree with the diagnosis of biliary colic? So a quick slide here on right upper quadrant pain in pregnancy. Um, and I have to preface this by saying that um, I am not an expert in most of the conditions on this page. And most of this workup and kind of diagnostic exclusion work has been done before these patients get to me. Um, but it is important to know about these things and their relative frequency in pregnancy. And so I've put their um, inc their their um, yeah, their incidence rates, uh, roughly speaking, um, up here as a gauge for you. Um, some of them are more confined to the third trimester. Um, but in any sense, um, you have to start by excluding the specific obstetric complications um, because preeclampsia and particularly HELP syndrome, um, that one of the features of HELP syndrome is right upper quadrant pain. And that's going to be um, one of these is, is probably more common than, than uh, anything else on this list. So you want to exclude that first, exclude preeclampsia. Um, and then other things like chorioamunitis and, and placental abruption. Then there's the medical complications of pregnancy, which are typically third trimester and relatively rare, but intrahepatic cholestasis of pregnancy. Um, that um, can be managed with UDCA to draw um, bile away from the fetus and decrease complications of delivery. Um, and you can um, help get the diagnosis by testing the conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin, and you'll see a mixed elevation. Um, fortunately, very rare is acute fatty liver of pregnancy, which is exactly as the name suggests, but um, it's associated with significant um, fetal complications and requires monitoring and obstetric care. Um, and then acute cholecystitis and other gallstone complications occur in around one in a thousand patients. Um, so you will see it, um, but it's not at the top of the list is my only point. Um, and don't forget that pregnant patients also get things that other people get. So you need to think about hepatitis. And then moving on to specifically gallstone disease, when should you do a lap collie and should you do a lap collie? So we used to say that second trimester was the time to do it. And that's not evidence-based, strictly speaking. It is true that um, there's a lower risk or the lowest risk, I should say, um, of operating is in the second trimester. And that third trimester operations are associated with higher preterm delivery rates and longer hospital stays, but no higher risk of loss of the fetus. Um, and there's this quite um, influential, I guess, um, paper um, from 2016. It's a systematic review of nearly 600 patients that showed that the complication rate of lap collie is around about 4%. And the risk of fetal loss is 0.4% compared with potentially over 10% if there's an inflammatory condition that you haven't managed. Um, and the preterm delivery rate was nearly 6%. And this paper's findings were enough for these organizations to update their guidelines and say that regardless of trimester, um, if clinically indicated, patients should have uh, a lap collie. And so the next question is, when is it clinically indicated? And um, this is my simple summary for that. Um, and it, I've laid the page out like this because the top two are equivalent, right? So is it acute cholecystitis or is it gallstone pancreatitis? Then whenever you should operate. Um, and in the case of acute cholecystitis, over a third will recur. 
Um, and we talked about gallstone pancreatitis at the beginning. That can recur any time, and it can be catastrophic. So if you get a chance to operate, then it's in the mother's and fetus's interest to have the gallbladder out. Um, but um, you need to be pragmatic, and there's no black and white line, but if the patient is getting close to delivery, then it's reasonable to try and wait um, if you can get them through delivery and then do the surgery. Um, but that's certainly not at the beginning of the third trimester, it's towards delivery um, where that inflection occurs. Um, and then the exception is, is it biliary colic? Um, because that's less of a concern, um, it's less likely to progress or um, other than pain cause um, significant problems now. So whenever it occurs in pregnancy, you can try to defer, but if the patient keeps coming back, then you need to operate because they'll languish in a hospital bed on and off um, until it's sorted. Um, and then this goes back to the case. So did she really have biliary colic? Um, and I would argue that this patient, because her pain was persistent, had acute cholecystitis, even though she didn't have the other things you might expect to see um, to clinch that diagnosis. And I've put the features of acute cholecystitis and biliary colic up here side by side. And my point here is don't underdiagnose acute cholecystitis. Um, there are a lot of features that can help you um, in a suggestive sense, pick one over the other. Um, but the only specific difference is persistent pain. So most biliary colic resolves it is usually postprandial, to be fair, but most of it resolves within an hour. And the textbooks will say somewhere like four hours or maybe six hours. And if the pain is going longer than that, then like this patient had pain all night, right? So it's not it's not biliary colic. It's acute cholecystitis. Even if the ultrasound just shows gallstones, even if there's no fever, even if there's no associated symptoms, even if the inflammatory markers are normal, call it acute cholecystitis. And why is that important? Because you should be getting the gallbladder out. 8% um, of women will develop new gallstones by the third trimester, and um, about 1% of those will be symptomatic. So uh, that's that. Amazing. Right. Anyone got any questions? It's always a tricky area, isn't it, when someone's pregnant? And, you know, and just weighing out the scenarios of when to operate and when not to operate and what to do. So I think that's a great um, topic you've covered there at the end. Um, Gary, I don't think we've got any questions, have we? Um, no. Uh, there might, yeah, there might be one. One or two. Uh, one from Roma. So uh, how do the patients who start with typical biliary colic then end up with quite persistent pain do post-cholecystectomy? How do they do post cholecystectomy? Mm. Um, yeah, well, um, laparoscopic cholecystectomy recovery is usually pretty straightforward. Of course, it is major surgery and it does have complications, um, but the pain episodes resolve if the gallstones have been adequately managed. So if the gallbladder is gone and the stones are gone and there's nothing left in the CBD, then uh, they shouldn't get biliary colic anymore and they just have to recover from a bit of gas pain over 24 hours and the, the pain of the cuts, um, which for most patients is just simple analgesia um, and about a week of limited physical activities. Um, I hope that answers the question if I understood it right. I think so. You know, that is, that's cool. What, 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 I mean, pre presumably the preferred care nowadays is very much cholecystectomy on the index admission for cholecystitis but that that doesn't always happen everywhere around the country still right. um yeah uh and 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 in which case antibiotics do you want to just cover that briefly yeah so um if you make a diagnosis of acute cholecystitis you should start the patient on antibiotics um, and if they're going to be admitted and have an operation i still think they should be on antibiotics until they get that operation um, and it's a reality even in places where index cholecystectomy is accepted in principle that patients won't always get there because inevitably these go to the bottom of the emergency operating list um, and some of them will get discharged. Um, so from a um, risk point of view for the patient, the sooner you can get it done, the better. Um, from a surgical safety point of view, during the admissions ideal, 
if that's not going to happen, then on an elective list at about six weeks or more so that you avoid that period where there's increased um, acute adhesions that uh, increase the risk of surgery. So traditionally, because that's what we used to do, is just give antibiotics and settle it down and then come back later. Um, turns out that wasn't the right thing to do, um, but it's an acceptable plan B uh, given resource constraints. So is there, in terms of doing the, it on the index admission, um, is, it to, is the surgery less complicated? What, just explain that a bit further, like in terms of why we do it then now. Um, it is it is less complicated because there's there's less chronic um, in, adhesions from the inflammatory insult, um, and it's safer for the patient because they don't have the risk of further gallstone issues. Right. Um, some, once someone's had acute cholecystitis, um, they're likely to keep having episodes, um, and it might be mild attacks of biliary colic, um, or it might be recurrent acute cholecystitis, but it could also be cholelithiasis or uh, choli, um, cholangitis or cholelithiasis or a gallstone pancreatitis kind of once once the gallstones are, are playing up then they can start doing anything they like really um you you can stratify them a little bit um in terms of risk by the size of the gallstones if they've got lots of tiny ones then they're much higher risk of traveling down the cbd so if someone's just got and you'll you'll often see this on ultrasound you know one big stone in the neck that's like two centimeters then you know, they're probably not going to have anything worse than what they've got when you're looking at them. Um, maybe a, a nasty attack of acute cholecystitis. Um, and that's painful. Um, but if they're not elderly and comorbid, it's probably not going to be life-threatening. Um, it's just miserable and limits lifestyle and limits occupational function. And the sooner you can sort it out, the better. And then we didn't quite cover but antibiotics and appendicitis. Because you sometimes say, like, is there any shift in terms of just holding people on trying to treat it with antibiotics versus surgery uh, or is that just ha um, give antibiotics pending surgery so it was a discussion um a few years back uh and yes certainly give antibiotics pending surgery yes do that um but there are two ways you can manage appendicitis you can take out the appendix or you can manage it with antibiotics and both are valid approaches um if a patient is um frankly septic, then you should take out the appendix. Um, but often you see those um, more mild cases, and most of those will actually get better with antibiotics. Patients with appendicitis tend to follow um, kind of one of two um, pathways, and they may in fact be slightly different entities. It's not well understood, but you see the ones who come in and they're, you know, peritonitic and crashingly unwell, and they clearly need an operation. And then there's all the rest that actually don't look too bad they're just sore and a bit flushed and a bit hot and you give them antibiotics and they start getting better and if you carry on the antibiotics they're probably going to be fine but the risk of recurrence is about 50 percent in six months i think so if you're wow. going to do that you need to counsel them about what it means and some people will choose that just because of you know what's going on in life and take their chances um uh, but also it potentially occupies more hospital bed days uh, as well so I tend to use it for patients who are not operative candidates. Um, put them in hospital, give them some antibiotics for a few days, and they'll probably get better. But anyone who can have an operation is going to get back to normal faster. And probably, um, yeah, in the long term, um, may well utilize less resources by getting the problem dealt with now. And that is what we need in our current health system. Absolutely. using less resources don't we yeah uh and that might be a good place to stop you think gary no yeah, further that, questions uh, that was a great session thanks uh, mark really good yeah brilliant mark thank you so very very much for your uh time this evening and thank you very much for um everyone attending i would really love it if you could fill out the um evaluation form and um give me some feedback so that's just in the chat link there and otherwise, we'll look forward to seeing you in 2024. Our first session is going to be at the end of February, and we're going to be having a look at oncological emergencies with Matilda. So that's on the 26th of February. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Merry Christmas. Thank you. Thanks for your comments, everyone. Thanks for the invitation, Lucinda. Merry Christmas. Thanks, Mark. Yeah.